Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musical storytellers. Presented by Spitfire Audio. I'm Kenny Holmes. Hey, I'm Robert Kraft. Also say hello to composer Carol. Hello, hello. This is Score the Podcast, and we are off and running after a huge season premiere episode with Danny Elfman. Thanks for all the feedback. Uh, Everyone seemed to really enjoy that conversation as much as we did. What a thrill that was. And uh, we're right back with another big guest this week. He scored the 2020 Best Picture, Parasite. He also did the Netflix film Okja, both directed by Bong Joon-ho. He's uh, Jail Jung. Jung Jail on paper. Jail Jung when uh, you're speaking to him, I think. We'll, we'll I think clear we're, that up. Yeah, I think we got to ask him, is he called different things depending which side of the Pacific he's on? Because I think in Korea, you may yeah. go with the last name first. And in Los Angeles, the first thing you say is, how much am I getting paid? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to point out too. This is this is a unique episode for the season because uh, we had a chance to meet up with JL in person last month. He happened to be in town. Uh, he did a concert, which we'll talk about with him as well. Um, but we spoke with him about what, maybe five days before the stay-at-home travel, everything shut down. So he was yeah. able to get back home to South Korea, but um, we did sit down with him in person. So this is the one episode this season so far. I mean, if things change later on down the road and we're able to meet up with someone in person, great. Uh, but this is the one episode that we did in person. So it'll sound a little different. And uh, the video clips that we post on our social media and stuff, you will see us in person. So we're not breaking the rules. This was done before the fact. Um, but we're excited to talk with uh, JL about his great work on Parasite and uh, a lot more to come with that. We do have uh, to thank uh, our sponsor before we get to anything though, Robert. Yeah, Spitfire. We're so lucky to have them because they're really, they're a great fit for our podcast because they make the tools that many of our guests use. Mm-hmm. I mean, they put together these libraries um, I mean, one of the libraries that is extremely popular is the library they created when they worked the estate of Bernard Herrmann and built wee, a suite wee, of all wee, his sounds. Wee, that's wee, it. Wee. I Thank hear you. that that's whenever not, that's I step the in the shower. Sound. Don't worry. That, that's not what you'll get if you get the Bernard Herrmann composer toolkit. I thought that was a Spitfire sample right there. <laughs> but that's part of the Bernard Herrmann composer toolkit, those crazy psycho sounds. And uh, you'll hear a demo at the end of this episode. Yeah. In case you have a horror film on the docket coming up, this is a library you might want to get. We also want to mention Spitfire's new Composer magazine. They do videos and written interviews uh, with some of the composers of the biggest shows and movies, uh, including shows like Ozark and Handmaid's Tale, which we love. And uh, they recently did one with uh, Justin Hurwitz from La La Land, who was a guest on our show last year. But we don't want to forget the most important asset we can bring to the fabulous listeners of Score the Podcast. What could you be talking about, Robert? We have a deal for you. We got a cookie for you is what we have. We got a cookie for you. That's right. We got a cookie for you. We got a cookie for you. And we have 20% off your first purchase. It's good Mm -hmm. on over... 50 different Spitfire libraries. So you want to be sure to use the promo code SCORE2020. That's all one word. And it's a limited time offer. So you should get in there and use that promo code to elevate your music. Remember, it's SCORE2020. Lock and load. Limited and time. Yourself- Don't wait. If you're waiting around, you're blowing it. Yep. Yep. You get a great get library. Get it done. Uh, a little bit of news broke this week. Um, mm. Exciting news for uh, Daft Punk fans. Uh, the director... Face to face! <laughs> Sorry, Dario <laughs> Argento uh, has a new film that he's, I guess, going to start working on um, called Black Glasses. And uh, Daft Punk happens to be huge fans of his, and they are scoring the film. You know, their last film was Tron Legacy. They did with uh, Joe Trapanese, and their last album was in 2013, Random Access Memories, uh, which we talked about with Giorgio Moroder last season and uh, with Joe Trapanese on uh, Tron. So if you're 
not caught up on season two of Score the Podcast and you're a Daft Punk fan, check those episodes out. But exciting time. And Robert, how sweet is that for a director to get a call from Daft Punk saying, hey, can we do it? It's just awesome. I mean, first of all, Dario Argento, who is known to mostly an art house audience, yeah. just got the elevation that any director would dream of. And also just coolness factor. I mean, working with Daft Punk on a movie score, that's got to be awesome. Um, it's going to blow it up too, right? I mean, that they're, just, they're bigger stars than the film will ever be. Yeah, and uh, for those of you that love documentaries, there's a new documentary that's been available for about two or three weeks, which is 20 Years of Coachella. Mm. And uh, it's been out there, and one of the highlights of the doc is the – performance of daft punk at coachella um did you go they i was there i was in the room and it was a face uh, to face yeah it was so amazing it was a life-changing performance for a lot of the people in the room and they even mention in the documentary it's one of the most memorable and legendary moments in coachella because you have these two guys in helmets way at the end we were in the back they're way at the end of the tent but man, that tent was rocking. So to have them do a film score, I can't wait to hear it. I'm just interested yeah. to hear what they'll make. Yeah. It'll be exciting. Um, we didn't get to do this last week because we had so much to get to with Danny. And he thankfully went really long in the interview, which was fantastic. So many good anecdotes and stories in there. Um, but we wanted to just kind of talk about what we've been watching. Um, a lot of stuff. We had some time over uh, our break and... Uh, also, there's just so many great things coming out now. Uh, Robert, what do you what are you caught up on? What have you been watching? I know you you well, mentioned one to me, and I wanted to save it for the show. Yeah, I um, well, first of all, one of the things I've been doing because in my household, there's the best TV is in a big common area, and Daddy is requested, particularly if the show is violent or loud to wear <laughs> headphones. So the uh, benefit of that, which is many, uh, because then I can pretend when someone says, can you do the dishes? I, I'm just deeply involved in my show and I have the headphones on, I just didn't hear you. But um, I also have been getting to hear the mixes really mm. carefully and the scores really carefully in headphones. I'm not sure how I'm going to go back to listening in speakers because these shows that I've been watching, the music is so interesting. Of course, anybody who's around me knows I've become obsessed with a series called Fauda, mm. um, which is about uh, an undercover police squad that uh, travels between Israel and uh, either the West Bank or the Gaza Strip in lots of missions and there's good guys and bad guys and you're never sure exactly who is which but uh and this is your headphones show it's, it's i am oh it's boy, requiring I headphones it's a lot of explosions and a and a oh you just unplugged your microphone okay robert are you okay what happened there um i i sort of it's one of the perils of the Zoom combination recording situation. I survived it, but I must sit very, very still. That's Robert has a problem lesson. sitting still. So this we're, we're only on season three, episode two, Robert. We have a long way to go. You're going to have to. Restless knee syndrome is not a good companion for all the things that are plugged into my computer. Oh, this is amazing. Because I knock one wire and see ya. Anyway. So where were we? Fauda. Fauda. Explosive, it's, violent. We should watch and, it. And loud. And we're, watch it in headphones. But one of the great benefits of watching it in headphones is you get to hear an incredible score by a composer I wasn't familiar with. His name is Gilad Benamram. B-E-N-A-N-R-A-M. I believe Benamram. he's an Israeli. Benamram. I believe he's an Israeli composer and clearly capable in both the world of orchestral composing and electronic composing because mm. part of the score is very emotionally string-based and orchestral and part of it is really contemporary, propulsive 
beats and electronics. So he's great. Um, the other shows that I'm watching, amazingly enough, also in headphones, are, are scored by the same composers. Mm. Each both shows, Danny Bensey and Saunder Jurayans. They score Ozark, awesome season, yeah. and Outsider. Oh, the also. Outsider was so good. So scary and cool and freaky. And the music for both was incredible. And I can now tell you the mixes on both. Sound effects, music, dialogue, super interesting in headphones. I recommend it. And the benefit is you don't end up doing the dishes until <laughs> later in the evening. How about, too... Just really quick to mention that Jason Bateman has like stepped away from comedy completely and is now just like putting out fantastic drama and scary mm. stuff and just what range. I don't want to range, get too much into that. But No, you're absolutely right because when you look up the credits, you realize it starts with produced by Jason Bateman, written by Jason Bateman, episode one directed by Jason Bateman. You think, wow. Stars in the show for a bit. And yeah, on camera. I have been watching, first off, um, the, the Last Dance, which is the, the documentary series that ESPN and Netflix are doing on the Bulls' final season with Michael Jordan. Uh, episodes three and four just ran on Sunday night. It's fantastic. Um, they had a camera crew follow the Bulls for the whole final season and bank the video until now, which is just incredible. Um, and I thought it was cool. On Sunday, actually, there was a little montage of uh, Jordan getting getting his rhythm, getting good, and uh, they were playing Party Man by Prince, which is from the Batman film. Um, so it kind of went full circle with our first episode of the season, and I got excited about watching that. The original score by Thomas Caffey. Do you know him, Robert? I, I don't, but I noticed that too. I always stay to the end. I'm sure all our score he's, listeners uh, do. I looked him up. He was He's the music supervisor, I think, for the SAG Awards every year, and he nice. does uh, some sports documentaries. He scored the HBO Andre the Giant documentary, which was also huh. really good. Yeah. Um, of course, I watched Tiger King. I think we all did. Um, I thought it was a little long. It was good, not great for me. It had some moments. Um, I don't know. Did you love it? I, I, I loved it. The only downside for me is I felt like I had to shower after every episode. The last one I want to talk about, and I may be a little late to the party here, but they're only in season two, What We Do in the Shadows. Have you seen this? Show? I know you've been enjoying that. Uh, so we we binged all the way through. We're caught up, and season two is coming out now, but it's based on the film that came out in 2014, which we also watched this weekend, uh, written and directed and starred in by uh, Jermaine Clement from Flight of the Concords and Taika Waititi, of course. Uh, who's just exploding on the scene, but it's super funny. Uh, the music of the series on FX is done by Mark Mothersbaugh, so you can expect mm. a lot of... It's it's very animated music. It's really funny and um, quirky, and it gets creepy at times, and um, it's it's a basically like a mockumentary about vampires living in Staten Island. It's super funny. Uh, so you guys should check that out. Huh. Okay, so before we get to our big composer guest this week, these are uh, certainly unprecedented times for film and cinema, and uh, we wanted to go to the experts to get their opinion on where we're headed moving forward. So joining us now, we're so happy to have, uh, he's a legendary film critic and historian, and she's his co-host, partner in crime, and daughter. Uh, they're behind the popular Hollywood film festival, Malton Fest, and the hosts of the fantastic Malton on Movies podcast, available on all pla podcast platforms. Please welcome Leonard and Jesse Malton. How are you guys? Hi. Good morning. Uh, Jesse, I, we saw on social media that you had a bout with COVID-19. We hope you're doing well. Uh, can you tell us how you're feeling? I'm speaking to you from a bubble. Um, I'm not. Uh, I actually, so I have, uh, I, I like to say that I collect all of the autoimmune diseases. So I have something called mixed connective tissue disease, uh, which leans towards lupus. So I deal with chronic illness and what we call invisible illness uh, year round. So um, I actually, <laughs> the hardest part of this was figuring out that something was wrong because uh, most of the stuff, most of the symptoms are things I deal with regularly. Um, but when I got, uh, I had a fever and that's sort of when we knew it was not just my normal crazy. 
and uh, yeah, I'm I'm doing fine. My parents are fine. Our dogs are fine. Most importantly, our dogs are fine. So glad to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So when when this whole uh, pandemic first kind of started the ripple effect of canceling events, uh, South by Southwest was kind of the first thing to go. And yes. um, of course, you know, even our film score wouldn't be what it is today without film festivals, without distribution and these these events that allow filmmakers to connect with these distribution companies and things like that. And you guys jumped right into action on social media. Can you tell us about why you felt the need to jump in and um, how that went? I know that you guys were trying to arrange different screenings and stuff before it really shut down. Yes. Well, uh, had we known it was all going to shut down, uh, you know. We might have tried to handle it differently. Yeah. Um, only, only in the sense that initially we were trying to figure out screenings yeah. and how things were going to get out there. Um, but we felt at the very least we could help uh, promote the films, tell people that they existed, uh, give them a little background on the filmmakers by interviewing them, uh, and, uh, you know, just beat the drums. It was also just, honestly, uh, you know, when this happens, you know your filmmakers, you know. Uh, when you submit to a festival and you get in, that's a big deal. And uh, depending on which film festivals you're in, some of them... Uh, require you to be exclusive mm -hmm. and you can only premiere here. You can only do this, do that. And so um, the idea that this was taken away from them um, was really heartbreaking. And actually, so my, my dad's best friend since he was 12 is one of the guys who started South by mm. Lewis black and uh, two, two sweet boys from Teaneck, New Jersey. Nice. Shout out to Teaneck. That's right. And uh, so South by has always been important to us. Um, and then over the years, I've become very close to uh, all of the film people there. And uh, I knew how heartbroken they would be because they, again, a normal human doesn't necessarily know that people who work film festivals, it's a year round job. Mm. And people like Claudette Godfrey, they are out all year meeting filmmakers, helping them, you know, and Janet Pearson, this is her life and screening films for hours and hours and hours uh, around the globe. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as I say, also just sort of holding the hands of newer filmmakers. And uh, so I, I just wanted, we wanted to support in any way we could. And so what sort of happened since is something similar where whether it's I'm sending uh, different publicist information about the films or trying to connect people, uh, they just announced that uh, they're going to be showing several of the movies on Amazon. Mm. It's a one-time gig kind of a thing. My, my mom always says that the first people to come forward in crisis are entertainers. Artists, yeah. And it, it, is, it is true. Um, and, and I love that. I love that creative people want to be creative and want to help each other. And um, even if it's just someone interviewing somebody, like it, it's, it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful that you acknowledge that. And it's been wonderful in some ways to be reminded of the explosive creativity that's out there. I mean, of course, we're all watching the internet and seeing every day the incredible parody songs and oh God. funny memes. And people have gone <laughs> to the ends of the earth to be creative and funny. Yeah. and Because they have to. Yeah. We have to. Have right. To. That's who they are. And they can't just sit by and twiddle their thumbs. Of course. And it's a great platform also just to be creative. Leonard, I'm looking at a, uh, and Jesse, you may have some thoughts on this. I'm looking at a headline in last week's New York Times that says, the future that Hollywood feared is happening now. Yeah, I read that. And too. it 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 identifies three main areas. If I can just kind of share the three areas, and then I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on it. It says, number one, summer. The blockbuster season mm -hmm. evaporates. Mm -hmm. Number two, fall. Film festivals are in doubt. And, of course, we just covered a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. And then winter. Will Oscar season crumble too? Mm -hmm. Since we just talked a little bit about film festivals, I'd love to hear. I read this morning 
A major studio will spend up to $300 million on a summer film. What now? So the summer season traditionally starts. It actually, you know, when I was at Fox, sometimes we'd be pushing off of Memorial Day closer into May 15th, May 1st. Mid-May now is... uh, So so what do we look at this summer? Well, nobody knows. Yeah. Nobody knows. The problem with, I mean, those three... uh, question marks that the New York Times uh, posed in, in, in that essay uh, have no definable answers. Yeah. Everybody's got the same question. Mm-hmm. Nobody has answers. Uh, all there is is speculation. And I mean, Christopher Nolan has said his film will be ready in mid-July and he hopes it can open in mid-July. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that requires theaters to be open yeah. and it requires Warner Brothers to go along with his uh, his philosophy because Warner Brothers can say, okay, we're opening it July. I'm making up a date 17. Uh, but what if there are only two dozen theaters playing it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it has to be a synchronized response. It has to be a consensus response. And, uh, and, and right now for no fault of anybody's, there is no consensus. Mm-mm. Uh, a Cannes Film Festival tried to postpone rather than cancel their festival. They finally gave in mm-hmm. to the inevitable, and they had to cancel it. Mm-hmm. And and Thierry Frimo, uh, the director, said he did not, he, he wouldn't accept the idea of a virtual festival in place of what they normally do, because it wouldn't have any of the qualities uh, of the festival as people have known it for 75 years. And uh, you just read Ann Thompson's piece. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Ann is the awards uh, journalist. You know, she's for every festival, every award show, Ann writes yeah. everything up. <clears throat> and uh, and she's dedicated, deeply dedicated. Uh, and she was just writing about this saying, you know, perhaps it will be something where there are. Uh, film festival branded screenings. So she was talking about Telluride might have in New York and LA Telluride branded screenings. Uh, Uh, For for media people. For media, as as opposed to knowing that it's a possibility we may not be able to get to Telluride. I'm wondering what what you think about the Oscars. Because, you know, we had two months of films coming out. You had Emma and... The Invisible Man had some good reactions, but like, are those the Oscar contenders? Not by my family. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> but my mother, the re- I just have to say, my mother is the real film critic, and when she ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm wondering, <laughs> do you do you foresee that the Academy even holds the Oscars? Do they change the qualifications? Because a lot of these studios are pushing films straight to streaming, which eliminates them on, right. you know, the official qualifications. Right. I think everything at the moment is changing. And I really believe that if anybody tells you they know what's going on, they're lying. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the bottom line is that we are all waiting. And uh, I do believe that in general, uh, whether it's a film festival or an award show, whatever it is, I think it's all going to be shifting. And everyone is just going to sort of say, Let's get through this. You know, I, I really do. And I think that people are going to find ways to make it work. So whether it's that it doesn't, ha- maybe it's that it has to be streaming for X amount of time, or it has to be sent to all of the uh, um, Academy, members. Academy members, you know, yeah. there's a lot of options for what can happen. And the truth is, because we have so much technology, we're very, very lucky that during all of this, we have seven million ways of speaking to each other, watching something, you know, really, you name it. It's, it's mind blowing. You, I'm sure you guys have seen, uh, whether it's, um, a John Krasinski show where the cast of Hamilton performed, Yeah. you know, uh, all the late night shows are having musical guests on and the musical guests are bringing in their dancers and, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. So I feel like I feel like the Oscars will happen, if nothing else, because they will want to make sure they happen. You know, they will want to make sure that 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 they say, no, no, we're not going to be knocked out by this. We're going to figure it out. Maybe there isn't an audience. Maybe it's people backstage 
coming out. You know, there, there's a lot of options, but I feel like everybody is in the same boat and people want to have some kind of hope. Uh, we were talking about um, animated films are still being made. Yeah. Uh, very carefully. Yes. But, and, and post-production on some big movies yeah. is continuing because they've figured out uh, workflow systems yeah. uh, where people can work at home and, uh, uh, and securely and continue to, to be productive. So, so films are still being, uh, mm-hmm. being made uh, in some cases, mostly, you know, uh, uh, they have live action mo- films with heavy visual effects yeah. components yeah. and animated films. Or films that, that had finished shooting and are just in the post process. Leonard, have you, have you seen anything, like what can you compare this to? You've been covering films for a long time. Is there anything close to what we're seeing? That's an easy question. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, what we're going through is truly unprecedented. Yeah. Uh, and we're all in the same uh, storm-tossed boat. Uh, no one is exempt. No one is immune. Uh, no industry, no business, no, uh, uh, no facet of, of daily life is unaffected. I just want to come back to one thing that we were just tipping towards, and it was really, in some ways, you've already answered it, which is no one knows. The curious thing, and we're all wondering to see what happens. Some of these businesses were already moving towards a precipice of can they survive? Can bookstores survive with Amazon? Can movie theaters survive if everyone likes staying on their couch? My question is, does this force a a crumble in the precipice of the the movie business? I don't think so. Mm-mm. Oh, good. Just as, and there is one precedent. Uh, remember in the days following 9-11, uh, people stopped traveling for business and they started, they didn't have zoom, but you know, there was already uh, something equivalent to FaceTime. Yep. And, and people started saying, have a, a you know, your video business conferences, uh, don't do it in person. And that lasted for a little while until the, you know, the sense of urgency eventually subsided. Uh, so people still want to, face each other for real. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, what this uh, experience has done is it's introduced everyone to streaming movies at home and television shows at home. Uh, You know, people who hadn't done it yet, who hadn't hopped on that bandwagon yet, have now joined the crowd. But does that mean that the day, the eventual day that Marvel opens its next movie, Black Widow, on a on a Friday or late Thursday night, going into a weekend, that millions of people won't want to go to a theater, and if there's theaters open, all of that. But it, it, does that mean they don't want to go out to experience a movie with a crowd of like-minded folks? I, I don't think so. Does that mean, does anybody want to stay home twenty four seven? I don't think mm-hmm. so. Uh, now, will that mean it's even tougher for the indie movies? Yes. To survive. That's been true for, for 15 years. Uh, you know, the, the, the theaters that specialize, uh, the theaters that come together for that art house convergence every year before the Sundance Film Festival uh, to compare notes and to help each other out, uh, with, you know, as they do, they, they've been struggling all along and fighting the good fight. Yeah. They're going to have to fight harder. And the thing is, I mean, as you say with Zoom, we've actually, so our podcast, we have only ever recorded in person with our guests. And that's for four years. Four Same. Years. Yeah, that's how we we normally do it too. And that's yeah. the thing is that especially we sit with someone for an hour. And, you know, certainly if you don't know the person ahead of time, it's just impossible. And obviously like this would be, we would love to be sitting with you right now. So, you know, so, so when it becomes an option, if it is one of those things that 10 people or less, you can bet your bottom dollar, I will be in a studio with other people. Good. Because that to me, is so important. Human connection is so important in the same way. Yes. We've all been in movie theaters when someone's talking, I'm the guy that will walk right up to you and tell you to shut up. I will take <laughs> your phone and throw it away. Um, I am that, I am that person. 
But, uh, you know, at the same time, I want to see movies in a movie theater. We want to be together for certain things. Yeah. There's something special. When you go see Broadway, you know, both my parents are New Yorkers and they started taking me to the theater when I was a kid. And there is nothing, nothing in the world like seeing a Broadway show for real. Same thing when you hear an orchestra and, and this was always, my dad always walked me over to the pit. When we'd first get into the theater, he'd walk me down and then intermission, he'd walk me down. And then at the end of the show, one more time we'd walk down and when they'd, we have to play, talk, he'd clap. My dad would <laughs> clap and I would clap. And that's how, what we learned. And it was in every way, the greatest thing in the world. Well, I like your optimism. I mean, I think we all need to keep that and we will come out the other side and it will be interesting. And uh, last time yeah. I checked, we don't have a lot of control over what it's going to be. And we're yeah. going to just going to have to figure it out. The <laughs> And I think coming full circle, one of the things that will be consistent is the explosion of create uh, creativity will continue Absolutely. the way it always does. Uh, artists are artists. Creative people have that instinct. I know that probably everyone on this podcast at this moment has that instinct of just making new things and continuing it hasn't stopped me one bit well uh jesse leonard best of luck with with the future uh, of course you guys have your podcast be sure to check that out all of our listeners great show and uh also we forgot to mention too that uh leonard is in, in score so uh be sure to check if you haven't seen score in a while or you haven't seen it at all leonard yeah right <laughs> just watch me in school. <laughs> score a film music documentary That's starring right. Leonard Moulton exactly. and oh by the way John Williams, Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman <laughs> and some others <laughs> Johnny Williams, I love hearing Johnny Williams Oh yeah That's right <laughs> But I thank you to say real quick, this last Friday uh, April 24th was Leonard Moulton Day in the city Ooh. of Los Angeles This is uh, the third year So this is this is the time for us to celebrate. That's so exciting and so well-deserved. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we look forward to much more from you guys in the future. We'll see you at the movies. As I keep telling people, stay safe and stay sane. <laughs> Bye-bye, folks. How cool was that? Leonard Malton and Jesse coming he's on the just, show? You know, he's the, the expert. He's the wizard. Hey, and Leonard Malton Day... I mean, we've got a legend here on score. Yeah. We, we so need that, a Robert Kraft day around here. What's going on? You know what? It's funny. They've been asking me. I keep turning them down. I just don't want the parade. Trying to they find the right to, day too, right? Yeah, I mean, how do yeah, you Yeah, I'm so busy. I can't find a day, but we'll, we'll do it. You know, we just. Oh, wait a second. We got a piece of mail in the score mailbox. Love that. Love that wow. sound when something wait. comes in the mailbox. That's awesome. I need that. I need that sound. It's the noisiest mailbox you've ever heard. Uh, okay, we have our first piece of mail from Score the Mailbox. This is from Sampson in nice. Richmond, Virginia, a K through five music teacher. Wow. Love it. Sampson writes, for the new season with Danny Elfman, I saw your clip on social media was done through Zoom. You both were muted, but your audio was coming through the video, I believe, while Danny's voice sounds like it was coming from Zoom's audio settings. It looks like all three of you plugged your mics and headphones in your own audio interface. This is kind of a techie, nerdy question. We love these. Um, Sounds like he's just asking how we set this up. Yeah, which is a great question. Um, there's also a, a little side note here. Robert, I had lunch with Chris Caswell back in 2019. Huh. His eyes lit up when I talked about Score the Podcast and he showed yours and his name on the credits of a Muppet Christmas Carol that he had framed in his studio. <laughs> my my checkered past comes back. Maybe we'll answer these two questions in reverse order. I can tell you that Chris Caswell is a brilliant arranger, um, orchestrator. He was one of the producers on the soundtrack, The Muppet Christmas Carol, with mm. Incredible songs by the legend Paul Williams. We we had a beautiful time in London recording the Muppets, and uh, Michael Caine was in Michael the film, Kane. and um, Chris Caswell was just great. So, hey Chris, if you're listening, I I'm, I was tempted to do my Miss Piggy imitation, but I'm going to save that. Just say Chris, <laughs> hey, hey Chris, good good to talk to you. That was hey. my best Kermit. 
Good. Uh, okay, so to answer your question, Samson, we're using a number of apps and programs, which I'm so glad that this whole situation is happening in the time that it is because we have so Cure much great me. <laughs> technology. <Sorry. laughs> uh, we're using Zoom just to look at each other and to get the video. We don't use any audio of it. We use a great program called Zencaster. It's web-based. It allows us to record everyone separately, um, and it allows them also to record locally and upload the file to us so we get the best possible uh, quality in case the internet cuts out or we have a glitch in the audio. Generally, when they send us the file, it's clean. So that's why you're hearing everything so clean. Now, I can't promise that it's always going to sound like that. Um, you know, everyone has different setups and we're working as best we can to make it sound as good as possible. But luckily, Danny was wearing like his Call of Duty headset and uh, he sounded great. So um, yeah. he set the bar really high for the rest of the season. So Kermit? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm now, you know, You're I had it pretty good. I used to, I was lucky enough to be next to Frank Oz when he recorded <laughs> the piggy parts oh, of man. a Muppet movie. Uh, and so I think it's I could, time, I think it's time for a break. And then wait, uh, I have we're more gonzo. You. I got, I got no, no, a no, lot no. for you. You're done. You're I'll done. practice off mic. Maybe next week we'll, you know, do Robert Kraft does uh, one of his favorite Muppets. Whichever one that will be next week. <laughs> Clifford, the drummer. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We're going to take a break when no we come idea. back. no idea. J.L. Jung joins us, composer of Parasite. We'll be right back. Hey, SCORE fans. I'm just wondering if you have a favorite question you've been dying to ask us. You know, you could send it to us in an email. You send it to score the mailbox at epiclef.com. That's E P I C L E. F F, come up with a good question. Kenny or I will do our best to answer it, and if we don't know the answer, we may make one up. You know, just to keep the program rolling. Better yet, you could even record the question yourself and attach that to an email. Include your name and your location, and you just might make an appearance on this season of Score the Podcast. Hey, this is Chris Bowers. You're listening to Score the Podcast. Now back to the show. Welcome back to Score the Podcast, presented by Spitfire Audio. We are so happy to have our guest in here today. You know his music from the Oscar-winning Best Picture of 2020, Parasite. He also did the music for Okja and Hemu. Please welcome Jail Jung. Hi. I think that's the first question we have. Thank you very much. Did I say that right? Yes. We <laughs> wanted you to say your name. Yeah, it's uh, Jail like jailhouse? Yes. Yeah, jail jung. Jail Ro Robert jung. knows jailhouse, I'm sure. I do. <laughs> and jailhouse rock. So you are referred to as jail? Yep. Okay. But but sometimes it's listed as jung jail. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Uh, actually, in Korea, the family name comes first. Yes. So. That's right. what we... Mm -hmm. But um, I had a moment to uh, speak with jail while we were... I say we editorially mm -hmm. while you, Kenny and Carol were setting up. Yeah, you were sweating it. I was sweating it. <laughs> and um, I asked him if he attended the Academy Awards when Parasite won for Best Picture. And he said, and I love this answer, no, I'm nobody. And I thought you were nobody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at whatever time that was that night, 11 o'clock on the night of the Academy Awards, you became as popular and successful and interesting to Hollywood and filmmakers everywhere as any composer could be because suddenly there's a lot of attention on you and your music. And um, I know that I went back and watched Parasite again mm -hmm. to listen to the music wow. and then listened very carefully to Okja, because mm -hmm. yeah, rewatched that. Oh, really? Over the weekend, I too? hadn't paid a lot of attention, but there is a lot to talk about in Okja oh. and Parasite with the music. But I think, Thank you. first of all, Kenny, where should we begin with our esteemed guest? It'd well, be I, I want nice to first. Know. I mean, let's let's catch up to where we're at now, which mm -hmm. is you've you've had an incredible year. You've scored the best picture of the first international film to ever win best picture at the Oscars. Mm -hmm. 
what does that feel like to you and what does that mean to you? Well, uh, actually, I've been struggling with my another works like uh, I, I'm, I'm composing pop music and uh, so I didn't expect anything this success and uh, well it's absolutely grateful but uh, no changes at all so you don't feel any different you're just back to work oh yeah I have to yes to make my life right <laughs> and uh, I I'm really proud of Mr. Bong oh my goodness just, Tru- does, truly amazing does he like to drink like he says he does <laughs> yeah <laughs> i um first of all i'm amazed by uh a couple things when you say mr bong first of all as a filmmaker mm-hmm. it's just incredible to have someone with that kind of imagination uh-huh. right. coupled to that kind of filmmaking skill mm-hmm. sometimes you get one or the other mm-hmm. and one of the f- facets of his imagination is hiring a pop musician Mm -hmm. that unless i didn't read all of your biography correctly Mm -hmm. before he came to you had you been interested in or had experience scoring movies uh well to be honest i'm a cinephile one of cinephiles Mm. but i'm not that interested in uh composing the score (laughs) uh because i had no confident at mm. all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one day he just found me. He just came to me. Do you know how? Uh, how he met you or heard you or what someone played him? He, uh, he's he been liking my uh, uh, compositions. Yeah. So he was a fan of you? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly pop and some music for uh, exhibitions and uh, related to Korean traditional music. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a film called a Sea Fog. Mm. We call it Hemu. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, the executive director was Mr. Bong. Mm-hmm. The, the main director was someone else. And uh, that was the first time I met him. So as a executive producer and film direct, uh, music director. And did you write, you wrote music for that film? Yeah. And can I ask, um, did you write to picture? In other words, looking at the film and writing music, or did you have music that you gave them and they just put in the movie? No, I just composed, composed the score only for the film. Only for the film. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. And after that, did you think, this is my new career. I'm going to compose film. Or did you think that was fun? I'm going back to pop music. Well, I think it's like parallel line. Ah, I could nice. do both. Okja, the first uh, film that I worked with, Mr. Bong, as a director. Uh, that was the first time I really... Like our filming, uh, make the score is like this. I really find it interesting. That was the first time I could do uh, a little bit better next time. When you first saw this film, how could you find this? (sighs) Actually, you know what? I really wanted to uh, release this OST. Yeah, the soundtrack was released. Hard to find. We're, we're, we're wizards. <laughs> <laughs> and this cue is unbelievably beautiful. Thank you so much. It, it transcends pop music to be genuine emotional film music. Thank you so much. <laughs> so w- w- in talking about Okja... Mm-hmm. Let's, let's tell our listeners what we're listening to. This is the end credits... Yeah, yeah. Um, music mm-hmm. from the film, which is listen to this. It this incorporates is... the theme of Okja, but it's so beautifully orchestrated. Uh, Recorded in Seoul and Budapest. Budapest. Wow. <laughs> Everybody goes to Budapest. When you first saw that film, mm-hmm. um, 
obviously the okja wasn't mm-hmm. probably in the picture. No. Mm-hmm. Actually, uh, I just saw a completed okja in the theater. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> For the first time? Yeah. What did you score? A, a, an animation of okja or was there nothing? 50% of animation. We should explain to our listeners also. Yeah, if you haven't <laughs> seen Okja, first off, it's on Netflix, and it's a, it's a great film. Um, it, how can I describe it? It's about uh, a, a, an American company creating a, a genetic animal. Super, super pig. pig. A super pig <laughs> to um, create a type of meat. Um, but it's the, the animal is... is given to farmers around the world to to raise it um and a young girl befriends okja and it becomes basically her her best friend her like you would with a dog and uh she's unaware of what the ultimate fate of okja is and then it's her quest to bring her home basically Mm -hmm. um but okja is a massive super pig that's digitally Mm -hmm. created Um, so when you you're getting this picture, you're seeing fifty mm. percent animation. Yeah. How mm. how difficult it is it is it to score to uh, an animal that you you can't really see or feel? Uh, well, uh, the surface was not important to me. I just fell in love with the script at the first time. Mm. So it was not that hard to see fifty percent of Okja. Uh, yeah, I just followed the stories and director's intention. And wow. did you, because we're always so curious about the way that the director and the composer mm-hmm. relate to each other, mm-hmm. uh, and there are all kinds of different varieties of that. Mm-hmm. Does Mr. Bong, mm-hmm. did he come to your studio and sit with you? Yep. And... Were there a lot of people in the room, or was no, it just, just the, two? And that's you, what I really like. Oh, that's so. <laughs> that's really rare. Yeah. It's oh, really? Re- oh, yeah. Because oh. I think often, if that takes place, which it has to, the mm-hmm. composer and the director, mm-hmm. there's often a producer or a studio executive uh-huh. who will come to also make sure it's okay, uh-huh. uh, and so. But I think Mr. Bong has so much respect and independence mm-hmm. that I have to imagine what he thinks is okay, everybody says okay. Right. And now, mm-hmm. of course, but what was what was that like? Did you were you nervous to play him your music? Sure, every time. <laughs> <laughs> Very nervous. And did he just come and sit down and you would play something and wait mm-hmm. for his response? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did he like everything? Something? Did he have lots of notes? Uh, yeah, he really knows what he wants, and he can say it. And he can say it very politely, very gentle, but very straight to the f- point. And I really liked it, and it was really helpful. Uh, even though he didn't like uh, my composition, but I know what I. I could do next time mm. because he told me very straight to the point. Is he a musician? No, but he plays guitar, piano, and he really loves music. And you play a lot of instruments, right? Uh, four to five. Four, what, what instruments do you play? Just band instruments, piano, guitar, bass, drums. Just four to five. I like how but it's... That's <laughs> amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm on the surface of a guitar here so <laughs> four to five is fantastic because we just heard so you can you played all those band instruments and mm-hmm. and but we just heard the end title of okja and it is a gorgeous arrangement for a string orchestra mm-hmm. did you write that on a keyboard and someone uh helps with the arrangements or did you learn how to arrange for orchestra yeah, i orchestrate everything that's incredible because i believe you went to we of course did a little research. <laughs> Did you go to a jazz academy or a or Oh, there's an institute called a Jazz Academy. Uh, it's not a university or a college, mm. but uh, I went there for one year when I was 
13 years old. Mm. And unfortunately, I couldn't go to college or, or university. Really? I had no time. Uh-uh. <laughs> I started my professional career when I was 15 years old. Wow. It's a good problem to have. Yes, <laughs> doing, doing pop music. Yeah, For, I was in a funk band. Ah, uh-uh, funk, eh? <laughs> Original funk or? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you play? A bass guitar. Ooh, that's the Ooh, that's the funkiest. that's the bottom of a face of a <laughs> funk band. Um, and you could have, we could have seen you in some kind of K-pop mm-hmm. band right. if things had gone a certain way. Correct. Mm-hmm. What was the name of that band? Oh, uh, oh, I can't put my finger on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but did you? Too think, many things have happened since. Mm-hmm. Then. Did you think that? You would, that was your career path, being a bass player in a band? Uh, for several years. But uh, at some point when I was like, oh, I just released my first solo album in 2003. Mm. Uh, from that time, I just started my career as a solo artist and composer for many uh for various genre and uh, the solo album was very far from funk or pop it was like uh pseudo bjork music mm. electronic and uh obviously the uh, orchestral things so is this something you were experimenting with while you were in the band uh yeah and then you just decided to, did you leave the band or did the band break up? Band break up, yeah. Got oh, it. That happens occasionally with bands. You know what I love about you is you, you seem to have all these different tools and, mm. and it seems like you're just, when you have a goal, you just learn. You'll just figure it out. Uh, and I, I feel like to. That's, <laughs> the, that's the underlying story with a lot of successful composers is mm-hmm. you have to be able to adapt. Mm-hmm. Are you constantly studying different types of music and learning? Because yeah. um, you, you said you didn't go to college. No. So how are you learning all of these things? Uh, by myself. <laughs> but I, I was really into classical music and electronic uh, while I was doing the funk band. It was very great opportunity for me to be in a beautiful band members and uh, doing fun things. But uh, I've been constantly uh, studying those kind of things, orchestral and electronic. I want to listen to that cue from Okja that has the... Um, we thought for a moment that it was either Mexican like a Mexican kind of, oh. um, or I thought it was maybe from the like a cue in the movie Borat, which was in uh, Kazakhstan. Yeah, but Carol, it was actually, like a it, it was when Okja was running, right? It was kind of like running of the bulls. Yes, mm-hmm. we found out that it was a Macedonian right. trumpet player. Right? How did that happen? Uh, Jam, his name is Jambo Agushevi. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, as a cinephile, uh, I really love uh, Balkan films, yes, uh, such as uh, the director called uh, Emir Kustrica. Mm. I really love his films, and he he's he's been using Balkan traditional brass music for a long time, and. Of course, I've been a huge fan of that kind of music. And for that sequence, the chasing sequence, uh, I have suggested uh, Mr. Bong about uh, Balkan traditional music. So, and Mr. Bong really liked that idea. <laughs> so I've been, I have Googled to find a proper artist. And I found uh, Mr. Jumbo. And I flew to Macedonia. Wow. That is incredible. Um, that's just incredible. It's so beautiful of you as an artist mm-hmm. to make that effort, not to say, let me see if I can make some fake mm-hmm. Balkan music. With the computer, yeah. Right, we have mm-hmm. yeah, a computer with some p- musicians near me that I can show. But you found the authentic, the authentic uh, 
music and it's just such an effort to fly there to do it. Also amazing that Mr. Bong said, okay, in a Korean movie about a fantasy super pig, <laughs> I'm okay with some Balkan <laughs> yeah, folk music. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I was surprised in Okja also I felt like some of the music may be influenced, and it might be just my ears, mm -hmm. by a sort of Nino Rota Fellini oh, music. Wow. You felt <laughs> that. Oh, definitely. Uh, was it accidental? No, no. It was intentional. Oh, good. Woo! We tried to Im imitate uh, Nino Rota and some uh, macaroni western. Definitely. Fellini. Robert. <laughs> Oh, yeah. good. Nice call. <laughs> I, it, so, it also kind of explained the film to me in, in a way. Mm. And I didn't know if it was your idea or Bong's idea or just accidental, but there's something about Okja that is slightly magic realism. Mm -hmm. And, f, you know, and a cinephile would say Fellini-esque. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not entirely possible that there's an enormous super pig mm -hmm. living in the hills of korea mm -hmm. even though it looks very real and the music says or running through the soul tunnels exactly oh. <laughs> or coming to new york city <laughs> yeah <laughs> but the music says yeah sort of maybe real maybe not mm -hmm. and i thought this is like a fellini movie mm -hmm. so and then I tried to figure out how in this movie there could be Macedonian folk music, Fellini music. The beginning cue, if I'm not mistaken, is feels like a strummed guitar. Oh yeah. Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> and You uh, remember a lot of things. Oh I, I guess <laughs> He I, forgets a lot of things. I forget, <laughs> I forget more than I remember. But Robert and I watched it together, yes. and then we talked about the music, mm -hmm. and then we were like, oh, guitar. Yeah, and actually we talked about how the music had so many different mm -hmm. f different kinds of expressions. Right. So Very The film required me to do that. The platform is totally different mm. for each chapter, from Korea to Seoul. And New York and somewhere slaughterhouse. Mm. That was intense. Intense road movie. Some cues were not cues at all. Mm -hmm. They some scenes were silent. Where mm -hmm. you, a filmmaker who was more uncertain, mm -hmm. would say, "I need music to help here." Mm -hmm. I kept saying to Carol as we watched it, "You know how good this movie is." They don't need music right here mm -hmm. to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And that's how strong it was. Do you feel that Parasite had wasn't as many different kinds you know of what? music? Let's take a quick break and then Thank we'll you. go into Parasite because we have a lot to ask about Parasite. Mm -hmm. More with J.L. Jung right after this. Hey there, fans of Score the Podcast. I'm David W. Collins, creator and host of The Soundtrack Show for iHeartRadio. Like you, I love Score the Podcast. And The Soundtrack Show is the perfect complement if you're passionate about music for film, TV, even video games and theater. Each week, I do a deep dive into some of the greatest scores of all time, as well as some fan favorites, and talk about why the music moves us from a character and story point of view. We also learn fascinating behind-the-scenes stories and share the history and background that brought each piece of music to life. It doesn't matter if you're a musician or not. Music is a language that we all understand. And through our love of movies like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Back to the Future, or even classics like Casablanca or Psycho, we can gain a deeper appreciation for how composers are speaking to us through music, explaining why we have such a powerful reaction to the images on screen. The Soundtrack Show is available on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, this is Dave Porter, and you are listening to Score, the podcast. And now let's go back to the show. Welcome back to Score the Podcast presented by Spitfire Audio. We're here with the incredibly multi-talented J.L. Jung. This is the theme from Parasite. 
And we were just talking about Okja and how there's so many different styles of music utilized in the film. And Parasite is in, in that same conversation. I mean, there's so many different types of music. Um, in the liner notes of your uh, vinyl, mm-hmm. which we brought here today, oh. um, Carol, what did it say? The, the, dark, the, the dark script. Dark but hopeful? The script listed oh, the music right. as dark but hopeful. Right. That was the first line of the script. And, and as a composer, mm-hmm. that could be a million different things. What was your approach when you first saw that? Or how long did it take for you to work that out? Uh, yeah, it took me a lot of time because uh, Mr. Bong didn't like my first version, second version, and that was the version eight, uh, seven, I guess. What we're listening to is version seven. Yeah. And uh, after the version six has rejected, I just felt very, uh, well, I just drum, drum. Yeah. Did you feel, a lot. Did you feel dark but hopeful? <laughs> yeah. I was just going to ask that. <laughs> and with Hangover, I just composed this version in the morning. So you got drunk. Yeah. And then you wrote this Hangover. Uh, no, I uh, just drunk and woke up in the morning with Hangover. Yes. <laughs> and went to the piano. I just, uh, play, I just started to play uh, without thinking. That's the best answer I've ever heard. (laughs) Did you call Mr. Bong that day to say, I may have something? Yeah, sure. And he heard it and said, we're good? Yep. (laughs) What's your uh, drink of choice there when you're... Uh, Mostly wine. Wine, okay. (laughs) Red or white? Uh, I don't care. (laughs) Composer tip. Composer tip from Jail Jung. (laughs) Get, Get lit. Get hung over. Get a hit. <laughs> and write an Academy Award movie score. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were talking about how there's mm-hmm. different styles of music, and there's obviously the, the belt of faith. Let, let, I'll just play a little clip of it here. This could be a movie shot in Versailles. Yeah. In the court of <laughs> Louis the Sixteenth. It's so intense. What was your inspiration for first off, mm-hmm. it seems like there's really no style mm-hmm. for the score. Mm-hmm. Each scene kind of has its own sound. Mm-hmm. What what was your your overall approach with the score. What were you trying to accomplish? Well, when we start, Mr. Bong suggested me to focus on uh, some sound. It could be strings or it could be percussion. Uh, Yeah, he just suggested me to focus on strings. And uh, yeah, we talked about strings because string can make... uh, full dynamics mm-hmm. from piano to fortissimo mm-hmm. and it has uh you could make uh, uh various sound effects like uh clusters like in uh pizzicato so we have decided to focus on strings and uh when you say strings you can imagine the string orchestra so i I decided to begin with the string orchestra, and at that time, uh, he uh, he has just uh, decided. To, Mr. Bong has just decided to use Handel's arias, mm. some ari- mm. arias, and yeah, from that I come up with the idea of baroque style. Mm. Mm. At first, uh, for that sequence, I I tried many different things like um which is not baroque mm-hmm. some pop music style or just um, or romantic some kind of that and but that was the uh, version 8 or 10 
And after seven, uh, he's had a drink. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> comes back to the wine, dark and hopeful. Actually, <laughs> for this parasite, uh, Okja was not, but for this film, he really didn't like my first virgins. Wow! So I had to write, write, and write. That's remarkable on every level, particularly to know that he stayed loyal, mm, that, right. he, that he would stay with you, mm -hmm. um, that he had faith. Yeah, that was yeah, really Were grateful. you ever concerned? Were you ever think like, maybe I'm not the one for this job after oh, seven, every, eight? Every day. Really? <laughs> yeah. And... It's amazing, seven or eight versions. Um, that is a great testament to your ability to keep inventing. I mean, well, keep trying new things. I think the most important thing was his patience. <laughs> yeah, he really just waited for me. And that's what I'm really grateful. Yeah, there was a contract, so I had to... <laughs> make it yeah <laughs> you you said you're a cinephile when you saw mm -hmm. this film for the first time mm -hmm. did you think it was an oscar winning picture did you did you know how good this film was when you saw it uh well nobody expected uh oscars hold on one second okay <laughs> robert's handling business outside beautiful <laughs> please continue sorry going back to my question uh -huh. when you first saw Parasite, as a mm -hmm. cinephile, mm -hmm. did you know what you were looking at? Did you know that this was a potential contender for uh -huh. the biggest movie prize in the world? Well, I think uh, nobody expected the Oscars. But, uh, you know, uh, after the shooting is finished, uh, I got the editing version without music. For two year, a uh, two two hours. Uh, there is no music, but uh, yeah, usually I feel bored when I get the film edited version without music. But it was totally perfect without music. <laughs> <laughs> really, I felt that at the first time. I think it's a, as I was saying, even with Okja that. That shows how strong a movie is if without music mm -hmm. it works. Um, I'm curious, where was the first time that you saw the movie with music? Um, was it with a Korean audience? Uh, I don't understand. Did you see mm -hmm. the movie in Korea, mm -hmm. finished, mm -hmm. with an audience, with a Korean audience? Um, mm -hmm. Or was the first time you saw it outside of Korea, I'll tell you why I ask. Because I wasn't aware until somebody told me there's some humor in there mm -hmm. that is very specifically Korean. Right. Um, Carol, we talked about the ramen. Oh, oh yeah. Ch Chapaguri. Chapaguri. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the translator uh, translated to uh, ramdong. Ramdon, uh -huh. ramen and udon. Yeah, yeah, it's a co combination. Yeah. Is those Korean two said uh, it was really brilliant translation. Mm. Wow. And when you land at Seoul Airport now, when you go back, you're in Los Angeles this week. Will there be paparazzi waiting for you? Are you a rock no, star? Yes. No, are, are you I like think so. B, are you like <laughs> BTS? <laughs> Oh, no. Not yet. Not at all. <laughs> um, I imagine uh, Mr. Bong mm -hmm. is a rock star now. Yeah. He's a hero I, now. Yes, he must be. And um, Have you, you been back since the Oscars? No. No, so this is your first time going home. Ah, after Oscar. Yeah. He didn't come here for the oh, Oscars. Were you in Korea when the... Oh, oh, so I was doing my things. <laughs> ah, so what was the what was it like to be in Korea and seeing this news and seeing Mr. Bong on the stage oh, accepting these Oscars? Well, uh, Where were to be you? honest, uh, I was in, well, my mother was sick. I was in the hospital. Mm. And uh, I just got the news from, uh, news with my text. And uh, to be honest, I still don't feel it was real. Mm. 
And a same thing happened in Gan last year. Yes, it won the Palm Door. Yeah, at that time I was in London mixing in the studio, and is this happening? Is this happened? Mm. That was the first feeling. So you're in Los Angeles now today for how long? Uh, by Sunday. Sunday, and I know we've talked about this a little bit before our mm-hmm. podcast, but. Are you starting to look at buying a big house <laughs> on the beach you're gonna in have Los to Angeles? Be, I feel like you're going to be making a lot more trips here. Malibu, <laughs> Santa Monica. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I would like to walk around. Mm. Well, uh, this is the second time to LA. Amazing. <laughs> First time was the... Uh, Concert. I had a concert. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. That's I right. was there. Carol went. And so, Carol, tell us a little bit about what you saw. And did you have any questions <laughs> about the concert? Yeah. So, I, I believe it was a live two picture mm-hmm. concert right. of Parasite. And JL here conducted, uh, while playing the piano, he conducted a, an orchestra. He was also playing the musical saw. <laughs> He's playing guitar. He was singing. Doing all, all sorts is, of and things. And the saw, is that the one from the, is it, is it Sunday morning cue? Is it? Yeah. Right. This one here. I was. You'll hear it. It's that. Woo. <laughs> that was better. Thank you. <laughs> we should sample that. I thought it was a theremin. <laughs> oh, yeah. Many people will think that. All right, how do you learn how to play the saw? <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> uh, there's a film called uh, Delicatessen. Delicatessen. Yeah. Beautiful. Robert Beautiful knows movie. all about Delicatessen. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> I know expert. that movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a sequence uh, of the playing cello and musical saw together. I found it really beautiful. Mm. So I've searched a teacher... But there was no teacher. And when I was watching the TV, one grandfather came out and played the soul. Oh, there's a teacher. So I just called the broadcasting station, found the PD, wow. and got his number. <laughs> the most resourceful composer <laughs> we have ever had on Score the Podcast. <laughs> if he needs to find something, JL will find it either in Macedonia or a grandfather playing saw. <laughs> Did you bring your own saw to the Ace Hotel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that sure. was you. I was really scared uh, during the uh, immigration. Oh. Yeah, I was going to ask, how do you travel with a saw? <laughs> oh, God. Did they ask, what is this saw for? Uh, actually, uh, Fortunately, they didn't ask me not anything. <laughs> that is a great... There's a movie right there. A composer bringing a saw in. Because uh, what are you supposed to do? Go to Home Depot? You guys have any <laughs> musical saws? I got a concert. So how was the show, Carol? Oh, it was great. Um, and you were really... Uh, JL was really natural at it. And I was wondering if that was like your first experience of conducting your own music while playing mm-hmm. the piano. Well, I, I conduct piano. I, I conduct orchestra every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but live to picture was the first time. Yeah. The click? Yeah, click. So I had to make all clicks. Even though it's a rubato, Yeah, I had to make clicks. I was wondering about that. It was really hard. And that it was, was the it, most hard thing. And it wasn't just clips. It was the entire film with an intermission. So that's what... You know, I was really surprised by how well it worked. It's it's if people don't know what we're talking about, when you do something live to picture like that, it's the same thing as being on a sound stage. You have to the musicians have to hear a click to stay on on beat on on the scene because the, these these notes have to hit where they're supposed to hit. And without that click, you can't look at the screen and know what's happening. Right. And if it's rubato, which means it's not in a defined tempo mm-hmm. and it slows down or speeds up constructing a click Mm -hmm. is really a challenge because you don't know where the next click is. It's not like it's 
and we all know what's going to come next. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm curious who your musicians were. Oh, Did you practice, yeah. or was this an orchestra from L.A. that you... Yeah, Hollywood Chamber Orchestra. Nice. They just invited me to do that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, they were really incredible. How big a band? Uh, just chamber size, like uh, 30... 32 musicians, I guess, approximately. And could they play every cue? Did you have the right instruments for all mm-hmm. the cues in yeah. Parasite? Mm-hmm. Is this something you want to keep doing? H- had you ever done that before? No. And have you done any since then? Have you done? Ha- are you gonna? Are you planning to do any more? Another concerts? concert. Uh-huh. Live to picture. I don't know. <laughs> we would like you to do one. Yes, please. Just for us. <laughs> Score the podcast presents. Parasite. We'll find. We'll find all the information. We'll dig it up. <laughs> I think. I think that's a wonderful. I think we should do another one. Parasite Actually, I Live. didn't expect it's. It's working. Mm. It could be work. It could, I can be on the stage. I was thought. Yes. Oh, so during the during preparing the clicks, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if maybe in the future mm-hmm. we could do a film music concert with you, but we could have your funk band <laughs> open the show. <laughs> so the first act is the funky JLs, <laughs> and you play your funk band. Then there's an intermission. You go off stage. <laughs> Robert Kraft and the Funky Jails. <laughs> there I you like go. It. And then we have Parasite, the score. And you co- you have to come back in like a tuxedo. Like All right. First one is like <laughs> kind of cool contemporary clothes. And um, man, the, f- the future is so bright. I can't oh. wait to hear. Do you have your next project? Is, is Mr. It- Bong already hard at work on a script are you guys going to work together again do you hope do you know uh nothing's fixed so how do you keep busy these days when you go back on sunday mm-hmm. do you go right back into a project or? yeah i have some performances to compose uh, for for modern dance one is for modern dance and mm-hmm. one is for theater mm-hmm. called a macbeth I know Macbeth. Yeah. And there will be original music in a performance of Macbeth, Mm -hmm. only in Seoul. (laughs) Yep. And do you have any pop? Yeah, we didn't really even touch on your. You uh, work Mm -hmm. with a lot of big Korean pop stars. Mm -hmm. Um, We know the song Wildflower by Park. How do you know it? (laughs) Well, Robert's actually been. That's his ringtone on his phone. (laughs) (laughs) It's a big hit. Uh, yeah, only in Korea. So far. <laughs> um, do you have any other recording projects coming up with pop stars? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not maybe, yet. Maybe a BTS collaboration? Yeah. Oh, they are so huge. Mm. So are you. <laughs> no. Yes, th- you are. Yes. yes you are. I think you um, need to write the strings for the next BTS single yeah i would love to good i'm going to talk to them about it so, i don't know them but i will find them and i'm going to do what you do just I'm, tweet them i'm just going to they try. only have like eight the 80 million right 800 million hi like that. i would like to introduce you to the fabulous jail jung and he is going to work with you on your next record thank you <laughs> thank you so current so currently no projects in the works but are you itching to get back into Sure. Somebody, if somebody needs me, would would you want to? <laughs> would you be interested in scoring an American film? Sure. Somebody needs me. <laughs> <laughs> and if the script is beautiful, oh, that's so good. I love it. And that's so important. I think it's a great, great thing to remember as we move on, which is that if you pick beautiful scripts, mm-hmm. of course. The movie is beautiful, the music is beautiful, and you and your reputation stay up here Mm -hmm. instead of what we sometimes see, which is composers understandably take the next job that's offered because they need to, Mm -hmm. and then they have some good movies and some stinkers, and that's difficult. It's all understandable to me because you have to work, but if you're lucky enough to just pick projects that you love, 
Oh. Your music will always be music you care about. Lovely. So, and I have one last question for mm-hmm. you. As a cinephile, mm-hmm. f- what is your favorite movie? And do you have a director that you would love to work with? Have you ever thought about that? Because you're now in that pool. Uh, can I be honest? Yeah, please. Uh, there's a film which I think is the masterpiece of the century. It's called The Revenant. Wow. Oh. Even for the score Ruichi by Yuichi Sakamoto. Sakamoto. In, in Yuritu? Ruichi? Alejandro oh, Gonzalez Iñaritu. Yes. yes. Mister. Yes. Well, we'll send him a note. We're going to send him this clip right now. <laughs> That's amazing and great taste. And now I want to go back and see it again. Leonardo DiCaprio, the bear fight. Right. He climbs inside the bear to keep warm. <laughs> it's really incredible. It's a wonderful film to pick. Really beautiful. That was the the Leo snub, right? I think oh, so. Oh wait, no, he won. Did, oh no, he, he won, won. Best, he finally best won for that. That's what it was. He oh, at the Oscars, he won. That's his first Oscar oh, really? win. Oh, and I think the right. bear was nominated for best supporting <laughs> actor in a uh, comedy, in but, a cocoon, <laughs> in a cocoon, but <laughs> sort of like how wonderful. Thank you. So much. Thanks so much for having me. For Jay Il Jung, thank you so much for coming on the show. Obviously, mm-hmm. we know you traveled to the United States just for this, and, and we really appreciate that. That is so nice of you. And I do know that the next time we call you to be on score, you will, I'm sure, say, you know, I'm just too busy because <laughs> I have to, I'm up for an Academy Award and a Golden Globe, and I'm the Grammys and BTS is like (laughs) keeping me in the studio all the time. And Ridley Scott and Steven Spielberg (laughs) are just blowing up my phone. So what a wonderful, wonderful morning. So make sure to watch Okja on Netflix and uh, parasite. If you're under a rock and you haven't lived in the last year, parasite is the Oscar winning film, JL Jung. Thank you so much for coming on score. The podcast Thank best so of luck with everything me. and safe Jingu. travels home. Chingu. Come Samida. Come Samida. <laughs> and uh, reminder to our listeners, rate and review, subscribe on Apple podcasts, follow us on Twitter at score, the podcast, Instagram at score movie, Facebook score, a film music documentary and stick around after the show. We have a, clip from spitfire audio to show you how you can elevate your music robert thank you so much kenny and what an exciting morning i've learned so much from a great artist and a great composer we will see you again hey score listeners we are so grateful for the support of spitfire Spitfire Audio collaborates with people like Hans Zimmer and the Bernard Herrmann Estate to build sample libraries that elevate your music. You're about to hear a musical demo of what that sounds like. And then again, as an exclusive to score listeners, Spitfire Audio is offering 20% off your first order. That's good on over 50 of their libraries. Yep, go to spitfireaudio.com and enter promo code SCORE. 2020 so they know we sent you who sent you School we sent podcast you and sent me <laughs> check out uh check out this clip right now from the bernard herman composer bleep, toolkit bleep, from spitfire bleep, audio bleep, bleep, bleep. listen to it in the shower
All right, reminder, use the promo code SCORE2020, save 20% off your first order, and uh, please don't listen to that in the shower. Were we rolling while I was doing that? I thought we were done. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We'll see you next week.